Okay, Dr. Rob, is cupping around an implant relevant? Does it matter? I believe that cupping around a dental implant, around a modern dental implant, is irrelevant. And the reason why there are so many people that spend so much time talking about um, the cupping that occurs around a dental implant comes from history. If we go back in time, we go back to the time where we had parallel walled implants that were machined, that didn't have any surface on them, where the crown was an external, where the, the platform was an external hex and it had a polished collar. All of the things that we don't do today were on those original implants. They had a significant amount of cupping that occurred during the wound healing process. So sometimes people will mistakenly call that bone loss, but it happens initially during the wound healing phase under the first year. So since it happens in the first year, it's really wound healing, not bone loss. Bone loss is from periodontal, uh, for peri-implantitis occurs over time after that first year, okay? So if you look to the cupping that occurred on these first ones, it was pretty substantial. And it was such a big deal that everybody was running around trying to figure out what caused it and what the, what, what the reasons were and how they can prevent it. And over time, what you've seen is we've seen we've moved away from anything that looks anywhere closely resembles the original implants. So now we have roughened surfaces, we have thread designs that are designed with reverse buttresses to distribute the loads, we have threads that go all the way to the top, we have laser lock for connective tissue attachment and bone attachment at the crustal region, we have platform switched, we have internal hex uh, with conical seals, we have just about everything you could imagine different from those first ones. And if you look at to a modern dental implant like the BioRisons implant, if you look to their own data, the cupping that occurs around their implant is about 0.5 millimeters, about a half a millimeter. Now, the question is, is that if you have a 0.5 millimeter cupping that occurs around your implant, is that clinically relevant? It's a half a millimeter. All right. And the answer is no. And the reason why it's no is because you, you have to have room for the skin. You have to have room for the epithelium. You have to have connective tissue and epithelium attached to the implant. You have to have a little bit of room around the neck for that tissue to attach. Otherwise, when you take the abutment out, you would see bone around the neck of, you would see bone underneath, you take the abutment out, the healing abutment, you would see bone and then the implant, and we don't see that. We see soft tissue epithelium that runs down to the neck of the implant. So if it runs down to the neck of the implant, right when it touches the neck of the implant, if there's a half a millimeter of space there, that space is for connective tissue. So combined, you have a half a millimeter of epithelium and connective tissue, which is substantially less than what you normally see. So normally, what do we see like on the facial of a normal human? It's about 1.2, 1.3 millimeters of facial thickness of attached gingiva, right? So it's typically, it's half, but it's only half right there at the crest. And from there up, it goes out like a V. And the thing is, is that that V is tracking the emergence profile of your crown that you're developing because you're going to put a heart-shaped crown on top of this implant. So you have to have a little bit of room for the soft tissue to follow. And so if you have a half a millimeter, which is almost visually not even possible for you to acute, acutely see when you unscrew an implant, I mean, or unscrew an abutment, you just look in there and see beautiful, healthy, soft tissue. It's just simply not clinically relevant. The second thing is, is that that cupping around the implant is not the papilla maker. So I use the word papilla maker from Coyce, John Coyce. He calls it the papilla maker. The papilla maker is the, is the bone attached to the teeth on either side of your implant. So the, the height of the crest of the bone attached to the adjacent teeth on either side of the implant is where you get the papilla fill, okay? So if that papilla, if the bone on the teeth on either side is fine and intact, you're going to have total papilla fill. You're not going to have any black triangles. You have a beautiful aesthetic outcome. So half a millimeter of, of, of cupping around an implant is just clinically not relevant. I don't ever think about it. I don't, I don't ever plan a case and go, well, how am I going to manage a half a millimeter of, of cupping around my implant? It's just clinically not relevant. It, I just don't see it. And case after case after case, you can look at cases where you have a half a millimeter cupping radiographically and then go to a clinical case, look clinically at the clinical photos, and it's beautiful. 
and unscrew the pros and look in the hole and see this beautiful uh, conical emergence profile of the soft tissue, pink and healthy, maybe a little bit of bleeding where the, connect, where the connective tissue tore when you disconnected the, uh, the interface. And it's just beautiful. And you're like, there's it, radiographically, there's a half a millimeter here, there's not. The problem is it came from the old school where we focused on it, but we've, where we've evolved to the point with, with a modern dental implant like the BioRisons implant, I just don't see it. It's just, just clinically irrelevant. And we've talked about in the, in the, in the uh, uh, videos here, we've talked about the 51 different design criteria and how we optimize, right? How we optimize. So you know, I, I've got the list of 51 reasons why dental implants can fail, like complications and things that happen from these different parameters. And as a dental implantologist, what we have to do is we have, to, we have limited resources. Our time and effort has to be optimized and maximized. So if we said there are five or let's say say four cornerstones in implantology, the four most important things that we want to get right, and by getting those right, we have a 99.9% .9 success rate. The other, the other, let's do, let's do the math real quick, 37 or 47 uh, different parameters are secondary, tertiary, quaternary from those first four most important ones. They have the biggest bang for the buck. So uh, cupping might be down around parameter might be ranked somewhere around 43, like way down at the bottom, like, like after you solved all these other problems and managed all these other issues, then you might look into what do we do about a half a millimeter of cupping around a dental implant. That's when you would, I mean, way down at the bottom. So get the four most important things right, get the cornerstones right, and you'll have terribly good success and you won't have to worry about cupping around a dental implant at all. And it just frees your mind up. So you don't have to build any sort of complicated uh, algorithm on how to place implants or how to restore implants. It's just very, very simple. And that's why we call it Implants Made Simple. No worrying about cupping. No cupping around here. <laughs> this has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer, out.